The Huffington Post published an article in 2015 titled, No, White People Will Never Understand the Black Experience. The writer reasons that a white person, no matter how blind to color, can only understand so much of something they cannot viscerally experience. To her though, white people must still educate themselves on schematic racism to help actively fight against something they cannot truly understand. In the movie Menace to Society, the Hughes brothers are on this exact mission, educating white people. We made that movie for white people. We made the film to inform them of something they didn't no. In this video, I want to explore how movies teach prejudice using various engaging cinematic techniques. Menace to Society attempts to do what the Huffington Post says is impossible. The movie tries to give an outsider a window into what it's like to grow up in a poor black neighborhood, and in doing so, they teach outsiders to empathize with people in that situation. The movie accomplishes this from the start in the first two moments, the rioting scene and the convenience store robbery. The rioting footage purposefully gives a distorted perspective of poor black people. From the opening shot, the camera looks at the carnage of the Watts riots safely from a helicopter, like someone would see live news footage on TV. The camera is physically above the violence and looking down on the people rioting. Once we get to riot footage on the ground, the filming is from the perspective of the riot police, never the black people. The white news commentator in the background puts obvious emphasis on the cops instead of the rioters. Even the pixelation effect makes all the black people look the same, removing their face from the story. This allows the viewer to easily generalize them as a group, not as individuals. The Hughes brothers are cleverly capturing the black experience in a stereotypical way, and in a way many white people experience black communities, from a distance and mostly with stereotypes. They further reinforce white stereotypes of black people by showing the main characters later robbing a convenience store, another stereotypical black behavior. They establish this white bias so they can spend the rest of the movie deconstructing it. After the riot footage, we go from a white commentator to a black narrator, and we no longer see the black people from a distance. We enter their homes and live within their personal stories. That was the first time I'd ever seen my father hey. kill anybody, but it wasn't the last. I got used to it, though. To complement this intimacy, the violence in the film becomes much grittier than the far-removed violence we normally see in news footage from a helicopter. The cinematography becomes clear, colorful, and up close. This change was done intentionally by the Hughes brothers to show that violence is not like what we see on TV. If it pops off, make it pop off quick, and make the aftermath ugly. Not like Rambo where guys just go down and that's it. Growing up, most violence just looked goofy and unorthodox. People had twigs in their eyeballs and shit. It wasn't pretty. By first using various techniques establishing the black community as faceless violent rioters, the rapid cinematic change of the black community into up-close, relatable, and vulnerable characters deconstructs the racial stereotypes. Start with the poor black population as an outsider sees them, then bring the outsider in and challenge their initial perspective with a personal story of loss and excessive violence capture the racism and then deconstruct it. Getting white people on the inside of poor black neighborhoods is a great strategy to helping them understand the cycle of poverty. I remember when pitching the movie to New Line, they go, well, what is different between this and when we see the black guy on the news every morning running from the helicopter? I go, well, you're in the helicopter and you don't know why that kid is running. Actually, films have used biased cinematic techniques to highlight sexism as well as racism. This is done more subtly, but just as powerfully in The Silence of the Lambs. The main character arc in the movie is Clarice Starling overcoming the mental trauma of her childhood, but there's also the backdrop of her struggling to distinguish herself in an almost all-male profession. Men sexualize Clarice throughout the movie, whether it's subtly checking her out or outright asking her on a date. We see her isolation most powerfully in subjective point of view shots throughout the movie, where we see through the eyes of Clarice all the towering male figures looking down on her. These cinematic choices put us in the perspective of the victim. Even the final scene has a man staring her down with her unable to see him, echoing the men in her career always watching her and looking down on her. The underlying idea here is that even subjective experiences like growing up in a poor black neighborhood or being a woman in a male-dominated profession will always be impossible to experience as an outsider, but directors use subjective filmmaking techniques to try to recreate it, and sometimes they do a pretty good job. Of course, they don't always get it right. It seems like historically, mainstream American cinema has had trouble capturing authentic aspects of the Asian experience. Up until very recently, Asian characters were almost always either the sensei who teaches using his Americanized Eastern wisdom or a racist punchline. Maybe the most important idea to grasp in these discussions of creating film bias is that they extend outside of fictional storytelling. In a famous example, how is it possible that the police officers who physically 
assaulted Rodney King were acquitted. There are many ways to approach this question, and the racial and political reasons for their acquittal are undeniable. But another reason is necessary to understanding that trial, and it's how the lawyers defending the Los Angeles Police Department distorted the video footage of the beatings to suit their story. The defense attorneys broke the video down into stills, freezing the frame so that the gesture, the raised hand, is torn from its temporal place in the visual narrative. The video is not only violently decontextualized, but violently recontextualized. It is played without a simultaneous soundtrack, which, had it existed, would have been littered with racial and sexual slurs against Rodney King. The lawyers whitewashed the footage for their own narrative. This is a perfect example of racially biased filmmaking used for evil. The lawyers create a narrative that white people are used to experiencing, and this deceit tries to justify the obviously unjust beating of Rodney King. Using biased filmmaking to create a distorted narrative is still happening, by the way. If you ever want to test this, see how two different media outlets film the same event. If your network supports Betsy DeVos, her Senate hearing is filmed like this. If not, it's filmed like this. The Huffington Post article may be right. White people can never truly understand the black experience. And this also applies to men who never truly understand what it's like to be a woman in a male-dominated field. But the closest we can get may be through a close reading of commentary on the black experience, like in Menace to Society, or by the perspectives in camera choices, like in The Silence of the Lambs. Each movie uses the power of cinematography to show experiences outside of our own race or gender. And that's the beauty of movies. We get sucked into lives and experiences we could never possibly experience ourselves. And some directors use that ability to teach us something about the world around us. When these choices are used for good, we learn about the human experience. But when they're used for bad, they cloud the truth and present the world in a narrow-minded and dangerous way. So keep a lookout. Thanks for watching.